Hey. All right. So let's get into it. So welcome to um, the Oh Hell No podcast. Today I have Rich Redmond. Did I say that right? You said it right. I ask everyone that because I'm always afraid of messing up the pronunciation of someone's name. Yeah. People <laughs> love their names. It's like music to their ears. Exactly. Um, Rich is very interesting. He is a speaker, a drummer, an actor, an author, and a podcaster. Woo, we're busy. <laughs> yes, you you have a lot of jobs. Are you Caribbean? <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Yeah, because my family's Caribbean and my mom always makes fun of me because I'm always doing all these things. And she's just like, yeah, you really are Jamaican because you have a lot of jobs. <laughs> but- it's good to, it's good to have a lot of revenue streams, especially when something like this happens that we're, that we were surprised about. You know? Yeah, I know. It's been crazy. How are you doing, by the way, with all this COVID stuff? Well, doing doing well. You know, I, I you know, I uh, my my suitcase has been pretty much packed for over 20 years. It's always in the corner calling to me like, let's go, Rich. It's Wednesday night. Time to go to the bus. Wow. And that's pretty been my pretty much been my life for the last 20 years. The taking the music to the people on Thursday and Friday and Saturday evenings and then coming back to either Nashville or Los Angeles for that 72 hour period during the week where I could write songs or produce records or, or play drums on, on other people's records. So it's a, it's a good life, but you know, that industry, the touring industry is kind of on its knees. And so I'm doing a lot online. I'm speaking online. I'm hosting yeah. corporate events online. I have educational products that are evergreen that kind of sell themselves. And then if somebody wants to have me one-on-one with them, like I do drum lo- uh, drum lessons and kind of like music business consultations wow. online. And you could do that in your underwear. So Right. <laughs> you are a hustler, Rich. I love it. <laughs> well, you, you got to. Yeah, you <laughs> definitely do. So what did you want to be when you were growing up and you were a kid? Like, what did you think you were going to be as an adult? Really young, I wanted to be Spider-Man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like he, he's like my favorite, like superhero, because he was so fallible. You know, he was so human. You know, he loved Mary Jane and, and, uh, and you know, he created this, this weapon for himself. And um, it, yeah, I just loved Spider-Man. But then when I, when I started to be a little bit more focused, I was hitting everything in sight. And I think I was just, it was my calling to be a drummer. My dad said, Rich, do you want to be a drummer? I think secretly my dad wanted to be a drummer, but I got super cool parents. My dad's an accountant. My mom's a nurse. They're, they're all recently retired. I'm going to go see him for the holidays in Florida. And uh, they were just very supportive. They drove me around to my drum lessons. They got me into nightclubs before I could get into nightclubs so I can get my experience, get my 10,000 hours, you know, playing music with other people. They just believed in me. It was, it's such a, such a great asset, such a great, um, it just makes such a big difference when parents are supportive. Yeah, that's really amazing. So you always wanted to be a drummer um, and you followed that path and you did it. (laughs) We're here 46, let me see, 44 years later because I started playing drums in 1976, just turned 50, went out to celebrate in Joshua Tree with my sexy girlfriend. She made it really special for me. Got me an ice cream cake, even though I'm lactose intolerant. (laughs) And um, we we had an amazing time. So yeah, I've been doing this for 44 years. Wow. Well, happy belated birthday. Thank you. I love birthdays. <laughs> and you look <laughs> fabulous. Okay. Oh, if I could say thank that you. to a man, you look amazing. So um, I was going to ask you what came first in your career, but drumming came first. So what was your first big gig or how do you, all right. So as a drummer, how do you like get yourself going and get some sort of a career? Well, it's just uh, that thing where you have to kind of put yourself out there. I think in anything you do, you can have a massive skill set. You can be like, yeah, I'm a great drummer. I'm the best drummer in my mom's basement. But you really, you have to get out and shake trees and shout from a mountaintop and let people know that you exist and believe in yourself. And that's not about being cocky or arrogant. It's just about having that confidence to put yourself out there and say, look, if somebody's going to play this wedding or bar mitzvah or supermarket grand opening, 
it's going to be me. And you get out there and you do a great job for people. And, you know, your reputation will eventually precede you. And your reputation in life is everything. And it, you know, for me, it took 44 years to cultivate and you have to be careful because it can take one second to, to destroy your reputation. So I just kind of went out there and just always tried to do, do a great job for people. And good news travels fast. Bad news travels 10 times as fast. So, yeah. you know, you just, it's uh, anything you do in life, especially in the creative arts, especially where things are so competitive and so many people want to have a piece of it. People, of course, they want to play t drums on TV or hear themselves on the radio or be an actor and see, have their mom see them on Netflix. But there's a lot of people that are vying for those jobs. So you have to fall in love with rejection and you have to realize that it's a marathon not a sprint. And that's, you know, as an educator, I teach a lot of young kids and there's a generation of kids that because of social media and the way we get information, they want everything right now. Yes. And it's just not going to happen. I mean, sometimes, sometimes people get a massive break, but for the most part for us, regular Joe workhorses mm -hmm. that have a dream, it's just getting up every day and trying to move the ball further down the court. Wow. Yeah. So what was your first gig that you were like, oh, my God, like I made it. <laughs> yeah. You know what? It's you know, the funny thing is, is that there is a, a thing about reflection and looking back, you know, gratitude and, you know, counting these milestones and chapters of your life, especially I think when you hit your midlife, you go, God, what did I do? Did I did? Did I took a job? Are my parents proud? You know, but um you know, when I started making money playing the drums, like when I was in Dallas, Texas, I wasn't a named drummer. Like I wasn't on the cover of Modern Drummer. I wasn't on the cover of Modern Drummer until I was 48 years old. And I think every kid wants to do that. They want to be on their magazine cover, you know, Sports Illustrated or, um, you know, Reader's Digest. I don't know what whatever everyone's dream is to be on the cover of their industry's magazine. But um, yeah, I was in Dallas, Texas, but I was playing in like, wedding bands and corporate party bands. And I was playing on jingles for like AT&T and the Texas lottery. And I was teaching drums in the public schools and I was in the best top 40 band in Dallas where, you know, everybody would come out and bite their upper lip and dance. And this was like pre, you know, not everybody smoked back then. So when you went home, I just <laughs> reeked of cigarettes, my cases, my drums, my hair. And, and it was like, Oh my God, I can put this all together you know, it's not a lot, but I can, you can make $30,000, like killing yourself to put it all together, but right. not having a day job, like literally just being in your craft. And then a lot of times in a lot of industries, you have to go to the watering hole. So in my industry, the creative arts, you got to go to New York, LA or Nashville. There's really just three places to go. And so when I was 26 years old, I gave my band two weeks notice in Dallas, Texas, and I moved to Nashville and I'm celebrating 24 years of being in Nashville. Yeah. Wow. So you love it in Nashville. I do love it. I mean, Nashville has been really amazing to me. They call it music, music city, USA, because see in Los Angeles, every waiter that comes to wait on you is an actor. And in, in music city, Nashville, every waiter is a songwriter or is a musician. And it's just the focus of this city is all about music. Um, and in recent years, like in the last eight years, I've been living part time in Los Angeles, studying acting, studying hosting, studying voiceover, once again, going to the watering hole, going to where the other like minded people and gatekeepers are where they can actually actually make a difference in your career, you gotta go there. Right. So, okay, you're a drummer. And you're doing all these gigs and whatever, whatever, what comes next? Like, what was the next position that you fell into yeah. professionally? Well, that, you know, for, um, you know, you have to define what success to you is, you know, success to me is I tell people a lot, if your car breaks down or you want to treat your friend to sushi, mm -hmm. you can do it. It's like your car breaks down. No big deal. I can fix it. I'm going to get a rainbow roll instead of the, the tuna roll that's on sale, right? To me, it's like having the freedom to do things you want to do in your life from your craft. That is success, right? Um, as a drummer, you can make a living in a local scene like I was doing in Dallas, but I had stars in my eyes. And my goals were to hear myself on the radio, 
see myself on television and travel the world on someone else's dime. And so to do that, I had to go to one of those three cities. So when I moved to Nashville, it was the same thing. It was like crashing parties, passing out demo tapes, working day jobs, playing for free or tips in nightclubs. And I met a young singer songwriter named Jason Aldean. And 21 years later, we're celebrating 28 number one songs. We've played every iconic venue you can play in the United States from like Hollywood Bowl to Madison Square Garden. But it wasn't a straight shot. It was just working together with these like-minded people to increase our success every day incrementally, just going up. You know, when you're going up the roller coaster, it just feels like you're ever, you're climbing, you're climbing in the anticipation. And let me, let me just tell anybody that's listening out there that has big dreams and big goals. You want to keep climbing as much as possible because on the other side of it is when you're going down. Right. And it's inevitable, you know, but you want to hold on to that success and that passion and fight for that relevance as much as humanly possible. So we played for five drunks at the bar. We turned those five people into 50 people and then we would come back and it would be 500 people. And then a couple of big songs came out and we started headlining half basketball arenas and then it became full basketball arenas. And and then you just build on it and it really it just takes time. Yeah, I love that you're saying all of these things, because I feel like a lot of people when they're telling their story, they skip over how hard it was to get to that place where you feel like, okay, I've accomplished something, you know, so I love that you're saying, look, you got to be dedicated, you got to work your ass off. And it takes a long time. This is not overnight, you know, sure. Um, So acting. When did acting come in for you? Was that something that you had like in the back of your head or what was it something that that just unfolded because now you were like in this industry? Yeah, it unfolded because I think secretly, you know, I think all of us like have this hustle and this focus and we start to get some success in like a pillar or a lane or this uh, industry that we're in. And we just stay there and we ride it out. And uh, to me, it's about taking, it was taking this success I had in one industry and realizing the commonalities between all of my God-given natural talents. So I'm very comfortable as a teacher because I have a teacher's heart and I realize how impactful it was to have the amazing teachers I had in my life and the the debt that I owe them. And I wanted to do that. I wanted to mentor a future generation people. So, so I started getting into teaching and then before long, it was like doing drum clinics. And then I was always into motivation. And so then it became a motivational speaker. And I started companies like Cisco and Johnson and Johnson and Hewlett Packard were hiring me. And they're like, what is your thing, Rich? And I'm like, well, it's like if you take Tony Robbins and you take Jerry Lewis and you take the animal from the Muppets and you put it in a blender and that's what my keynote is. It like, it like mixes music and motivation and drumming and storytelling and humor. And I'm spitting and I'm sweating on everybody. And they could see that I am living like what I'm talking about. I'm wearing my heart on my sleeve. I got the microphone in my hand when I'm, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm doing my speeches. And then that kind of grew into like hosting. And it was like, Oh my God, I've always loved comedy. And like, I love three's company. So it's like, oh, me well, too. That's Jack like Tripper. Oh yes. Right. And, and so I'm thinking to myself, why not? Why not give this a try? I got a little bit of, I got some, some expendable income. Let me go out. I'll, I'll take acting lessons. I'll get some headshots. You know, it's not going to happen if you don't do it. But, you know, really what defines me when I get up in the morning is, is I'm a musician and the, 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 my, the, the, the gods have smiled on me because if I was watching MTV as a young man, I was thinking to myself, am I ever going to, to, to know that I'm played with Brian Adams and Bob Seger and all these people that I grew up eating cereal in my underwear and watching MTV and Martha Quinn and JJ Jackson and Nina Blackwood and Alan Hunter, all the VJs are going, I want to do that. And I pulled it off, man, somehow by the sweat of my brow. But I think that if you have a success in one industry, if you're smart, you will figure out a way to leverage your success into whatever else you want to do. Yeah, that is so good. So what do you think though, is the one characteristic that you have that made all of these other things possible? Hustle, drive, passion, persistence, not taking no for an answer, um, just showing up, 
you know, every day and trying to constantly and consistently exceed expectations because people, you know, of course they expect if they're going to hire a musician, they want that person to be good on their instrument. They want them to be con competent, but if you go beyond that and you have a huge smile on your face and you're passionate and you could take direction and you know how to read a room and you're happy to be there and you have a firm handshake and people could just tell that you're, you're grateful to be there. All that stuff makes a massive difference. Yeah. Massive because people want to hang around with other like-minded people or people that see the world in the same way or people that are just nice. You know, that's why, you know, I talk about in my speeches that crash concept for success crash is so easy to remember just stands for commitment, relationships, attitude, skill, and hunger. So if you commit to your craft, if you commit to your friends, your family, your cause, you will be successful. If you realize that people are the gatekeepers to all things in life, everything that I've done has never come from a resume. It's always come from relationships. If you realize that attitude is 99% of life, if you realize that you can never uh, rest on your laurels that you have to consistently to be, be cultivating your skill set. And then if you stay hungry for success, no matter how, how much success comes to you, you still have to have that fire in your belly to keep moving things forward. So you don't become the fat Elvis, right? Like, I don't want to be the fat Elvis. I want to be the sexy young Elvis. You know what I mean? That was like <laughs> stirring things up. So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I love that you said that about, um, relationships. Now, do you think it's who you know, or what you know? Wow, I wouldn't say or I would say it's who you know, and what you know, and who knows you. Oh, and, I love that. Yes. <laughs> and you know, what's great today, you know, when I when I talk to Sometimes I talk to musicians or creatives that are my same age, or they might be a generation or two older than me. And I say, look at, I know it's a drag. I know it's adding more time to your day, but please embrace social media. Just find those thousand true believers in you. And it literally, if you can sell, you know, I don't, I forget what the math is, but if you can sell like a thousand people, you know, a hundred dollar product every year, you're going to make a good income. So just find those true believers that, that have those common things with you. So if you're not on YouTube, if you're not on Instagram, if you're not on Twitter, if you're not on Facebook in today's world, you are invisible. Yeah. It's sad, but it's a fact. And so just find out that, you know, people that do what you do, that you admire, model yourself after them and how they got there. Of course, don't do the same thing, but kind of use it as inspiration. Like here's a drummer that I really, and that is very successful or here's a, here's a chef that's very successful or here's a small town business owner that's having some success. Get on. If, if a trash pickup service has a Facebook page and they can make trash sexy, then any of us that are listening to this podcast that are into the creative arts or entrepreneurs, we're going to make whatever we do sexy. That's our job. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you said, you know, be inspired by someone who is doing something you want to do, but stay in your lane, be authentic and do you don't forget to do you right. Yeah, don't yeah, don't be fake. I mean, just show yourself right. warts and all like I, I kind of, you know, it's it's the entertainment business, you have to play some games and it's perception, you got to have yes. great photos, you have to have great assets. Um, but, uh, you know, be authentic and share your whole warts and all story if you can. Yes. So can you tell me what was the most unfulfilling job that you've ever had? And <laughs> what can you pull from that job and say that even though this was the most unfulfilling, I hated it. This is what I learned from it and took to other areas in my life. Sure. Great question. Um, you know, I, I was always a hustler as a young man growing up in Connecticut. I, I raked leaves, I shoveled snow and I had a paper out and this was all before my 10th birthday. So my parents leading by example, you know, they always showed me that the value of a hard day's work. And if you want something, you want that star Wars figure, go make the money to get it. Right. Yeah. And then haven't had a lot of day jobs. When I moved to Nashville, I was parking cars. I was a courier. I was a waited tables. And I think everybody should wait tables at some point in their life. Just so you realize it's so hard for those people to make a living and you're 20%. Like I hardly ever tip less than 20% because those people need it. You got to be really bad for me to tip under 20%. And then um, I also was a kid. I was a K through three 
uh, substitute teacher. So I'm playing in the nightclubs until three in the morning. And then at seven, I'm wearing my chinos with my briefcase and I'm teaching a classroom full of kids. That was really hard on me, but I try to find value and some sort of enjoyment or something that I can take with me or make a new friend in anything I do. Um, but those were, you know, the first couple of years in Nashville were very ramen noodle, <laughs> you know, maxed out credit cards, really just reminding myself, you can do this kid, just stay in the game. Right. You know, you know, Oh my gosh. All right. So what has been your biggest struggle in each of your fields? So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say the field and you're going to tell me what the struggle has been in that field and how you overcame it. So in acting. Okay, so I'm a new actor. I've been at it for six years, got my SAG card. I'm very proud of that. The, the, the biggest obstacle in that field is the fact that I have to fit it in around all of my other activities that are, are, that are also very solid and, and, and opportunities come to me. So sometimes I have to say no to opportunities to chase certain things. It's like my schedule is like Tetris, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, 2021 is going to be interesting because I might not be touring because of the situation we're in, which gives me a whole fresh 365 days to focus on um, acting, speaking, and authoring. So I'm going to be, I'm excited about that. Nice. Drummer. What's so, the, yeah. so the drumming thing is there's two ways you can make money. There's, um, well, there's a couple ways. You could be a, you could be a member of a band. So say I was the drummer in say you too. So like, we're probably not going to do anything until I get a phone call from Bono and, and I fly my helicopter from my castle to his castle <laughs> and we go to rehearse and we go and it's just, a, it's an amazing thing. Then there's the other thing, which is where I've been my entire life and most of my colleagues that I went to college with, which is, we're sidemen, so we'll get a situation. My friends with Cher right now, and then I have another friend who's with Melissa Etheridge, and I'm with Jason Aldean, another friend who's, and we're just waiting for that schedule to come, and then we go out and do the shows that we need to go do that, and that eats up a lot of our time because you're on planes and trains and airplane, you know, bus station. You're you're traveling a lot, um, and then there's doing studio work, and so I try to always have some sort of a fun original project. I do my touring job and then I do recordings and it's just that same thing of the scheduling, you know, mm -hmm. the scheduling is, is a nightmare. It's a delightful nightmare, but it's, it's, a, it's a, it's okay. a challenge. And I take notes and I write stuff. So just so you don't think sure. I'm like no, no. texting while <laughs> <laughs> my co I have a co-host and people are always like, what is he doing over there? And I always say, he's taking show notes. He's <laughs> researching your website. That's why we keep him around. Oh my God. <laughs> so speaker, being a speaker, a public, you know, speaker, what is the struggle there? And again, it's scheduling because I'll get like a tour schedule for the beginning of the year. And I go, okay, on all these blue dots, I have got to be in these certain cities. And then some event planner or some person from corporate America that wants to hire you for an event goes, well, I wish we had flexibility. We really want you. You're our first choice, but the event is on August 21st and your tour dates say that you're in St. Louis. And I'm like, uh -huh. yeah, you know? And so it's just, you just hope for, you hope for the speaking engagements that come Sunday through Wednesday. And then I, I squeeze them in and then I'll jump on some red eye and I'll go meet my band. It's a very exciting life, lots of travel. Um, and, and it's very, some of, some of it's very last minute. It's like, you know, just rolling with the punches. So podcasting, please tell me a struggle that you have there. Well, yeah. the struggle with podcasting, as we all know, is that there is literally, literally 1 million podcasts. <laughs> so people are going out, they're buying a USB microphone, they're going into their used MacBook, they're calling their friends over, and they're putting these things out. And sometimes no one hears these things. So someone like yourself or like myself that has a quality program where you spend a lot of time researching guests, getting the most high quality guests possible. Then it comes, well, is someone sponsoring my show and how can I market this show to get it higher on that list of 1 million choices? And it's a, it's an interesting game, you know, but it's yeah. uh, it's, you know, back in the day there was just terrestrial radio and then that was, if you weren't a radio man or a radio woman, yeah, you're not going to have a show. And now the barrier of entry, entry is so low, we can all create our own content. And let's face it, some of my favorite programming on, 
on you know, HBO, Netflix, Hulu, Hulu is someone that grabbed their iPhone, did some guerrilla filmmaking. They built up an audience on YouTube. Before you know it, they're having lunch with the suits at HBO and they're winning Golden Globes. It right. happens. It happens. It really does. I'm such a hater that when someone really famous starts a podcast and I'm like, <laughs> Don't they have enough outlets? Do they need a podcast? What is this? This is ridiculous. And they get high level sponsors people. immediately. Yeah. Right. Their, spo their sponsors are like immediately are like Starbucks, Spotify, Levi's and uh, Squarespace. And you're like, exactly. oh, wow. I'm like, let the little people who've been sitting in the cut get some time to talk. <laughs> but that's okay. It's going to happen because it's just that same thing. It's that passion and it's the persistence. It's not taking no for an answer and not stopping. Because if you stop, you're at the end of the line. So I... you can't stop. Oh, I love that. If you stop, you're at the end of the line. <laughs> and then as an author, I guess it's going to be your schedule, right? Well, as for the author, it's the same thing. Now, let's let's face it. People will have different uh, viewpoints on Jeff Bezos, but I I'm a fan of Jeff Bezos because of, you know, because he made it possible for anyone with an idea to become an author yes. and to put out a a product in three formats: a digital version, a dead tree version, and I recorded my own voiceover for my for my uh, book, which. A very was very fun, right? Okay. So <clears throat> the challenge there, uh, once again, is uh, to getting it out in the public eye. Of course, if you're strong on your socials, you can keep letting people know that these all you have all these products and services, right? Mm -hmm. That buy my book. Uh, sometimes I feel like a snake oil salesman because I have so many products and services. Yeah. So I have to really be careful with that because people don't like constantly being sold to. Mm -hmm. So, so if people are out there and they're trying to build up their social media, just realize that you should go right hook, right hook, left hook. You know, you put value, value, please support me and buy something from me. Kind of balance it out. Yeah, that's great advice. So you do a lot. Your schedule is very busy. What do you sacrifice the most to live the life you live? Well, um, and I got to say in COVID, I got this little Nike running app. I've always been a runner um, and I have ran 550 miles in COVID. Nice. So I just made sure that every day I got out and I smelt fresh air and the sun hits you and you get vitamin D and there's something that's very uh, spiritual about being out in nature. And so I go out there and I'll listen to podcasts or great music, get inspired and I'll go out there and I'll just sweat. I'm so glad I, I did that. But um, that doesn't always happen when I'm so busy. I don't get my workout every single day. Mm -hmm. And I've been married two times. That's hard. You know, yeah. when, when, when I was touring incessantly with Jason Aldean in the early days, I would be gone 290 days a year. Wow. And that's really hard on relationships. That was like pre-FaceTime. Um, yeah, but for the most part, I try to be a balanced person, get the right amount of sleep, drink water, take great vitamins, um, do your gratitude list, get your exercise, um, say hello to mom and dad, you know, have someone that loves you and you love them. Right. Yeah, all that stuff. Good. You know, yeah. Well, you look good. So whatever you're doing, <laughs> ah, doing you. it. <laughs> thank you. So um, what do you feel that you are doing that feeds your soul? Of all the things that you do, what is the one thing or a, you could have a couple of things that really make you feel warm inside? Sure. Um, well, I feel like it's a privilege to be a musician because music, I feel, is like one of our highest forms of expression. Yes. And it's like communicating straight through God, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, you know, me playing the drums. I'm playing man's first instrument. So we're going like post dinosaurs. Whenever we crawled out of the ocean and started walking up all right with our hairy legs, we were like, oh my God, I'm going to beat this. I'm going to take this animal skin. I'm going to put it over this log. And this is going to be the first form of human communication. And so I love going out there, whether it's five people or, you know, 50,000. I love that. Um, I love, I love entertaining people. I'm an entertainer. I love taking people away from their problems. If I'm sharing a message um, on a speech, it's like 
I hope people, I hope I affect one person in this room and it changes their lives. Same thing with like teaching just a drum lesson with like a, a young person, like a, a five-year-old drummer. And they're like, wow, Rich, it's so good to meet you, man. And we get to take a picture together and I teach him a drum lesson. I just think there's so many, God, I'm lucky. I get to do some cool things every day of my life. Yeah. Music is like, I don't know. I always say if I could wish for one um, talent, it would be like to sing. I think it's yeah. just so amazing to be able to like, you know, create music and the people who create the music and write the music and play the music and the instruments. Like, yeah. I just love that stuff. It's amazing. So yeah. Um, well, cool. we, we, we need more appreciators like you, because obviously the value of music has been highly devalued. You know, I tell a joke all the time. I say, um, people will buy, will spend two ninety nine on a fart app, but they won't spend 99 cents on a piece of art, a piece of music that's coming from someone's soul, yes. you know, and now we, we don't pay for music at all. We just pay, I mean, $10 a month on Spotify and you have all the world's music. And I resisted it. I was like, I will not support big brother. And of course you, 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 you can't, you have no. to join the party. It's yeah. like, you got to get on board. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it, it really is. I mean, music, I that's when I always interview people who like do music, like people who are starting out, because I love to interview those people who the passion is there and they're just trying to make it and, you yeah. know, talk to them. And I just want to know, like, how did this music come to you? Like, what do you feel when you make it? Because when I listen to a song and I listen to just like the music, I'm just like, oh, my gosh, the way this comes together, the drums, the piano, the this, yeah. the that. That is pretty dope. So I love that you <laughs> really appreciate it because it really is amazing. Well, thank you so much. My, my girlfriend thinks I'm crazy because she's she's a slow riser. It takes her a while to get up in the morning, like with her coffee, maybe two cups of coffee. I spring out of bed and I'm singing show tunes and I've, I'm <laughs> writing something and I go and I get on my djembe or my cajon and I'm playing. I'm making the neighbors down. They're like, it's eight o'clock. It's oh you're playing. You're, you know, I just love it. Man. Yeah, it's you're a creative. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> So this is the Oh Hell No podcast. So you have to share an Oh Hell No moment that has changed your perspective on something or taught you something. Hmm. I wish I had thought about it. Oh, hell no. Now, yeah. when, we, when we were doing the summit together, did everybody say, oh, hell no? They did. A lot of people were saying it. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's a great title. Um, Thank you. Every day can in my industry could be a little oh hell no like there yes. there could be little there could be little setbacks and it's how you take those setbacks and deal with those setbacks the only thing we can control is our mindset and how we react to things because life is going to come at us and we're going to be like oh hell no a flat tire i'm going to be late for this oh no i forgot to pay that bill or oh i really don't want to work for this guy but oh the money is good today you just be you're just like <laughs> oh hell yes Oh, hell yes. No, Rich. I want to know a moment where something happened and you were like, oh, hell no. And that moment made you do something different going forward. Or you remember that moment so that you stay in a certain mind frame about something. Okay, I'll tell you a story. I think the year was um, 2013, around then. I was married at the time and our band had, was playing a sold out show at the Hollywood Bowl. Now, this is my favorite venue in Los Angeles. The Beatles have played there. Jimi Hendrix played there. The Who, everyone. Tom Petty played his last show there. I mean, so just to step on that stage. So during the day before soundcheck, I had a big old domestic argument with my, with my, with my wife at the time. And I said to myself, Oh, hell no. This ain't taking me down. I am going to go out there. I'm not taking my personal life to the stage. I am going to play a show of all shows tonight. And I really focused my energy on that. And I didn't let that, that situation take me down. And when I walked off that stage, I was, I felt a foot taller. I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, you played a great show tonight, young man. It was, it was full of fire. It was full of energy. I executed, it was full of passion. And I, and I was doing two things. I was satisfying myself because this was a goal of mine to play that venue. And I wanted, wanted to play that venue when I was 21. I played that venue when I was 41. 
Mm. And that's a long time of people saying, oh, hell no, I ain't going to give you a job, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, and, and, and also that same night I showed up for my band because the drummer, the drummer is the fuel. He's the energy. He's yes. the heartbeat. He sets the pace for everything. And when a, you can't have your drummer mailing in a show, mm. it has to, be, he has to be like, you know, hundred percent energy at all times. Yeah. So you channel that negative energy that came, you know, from your the events that took place earlier and you put that you turned it around and put it into your performance and kicked butt. It became a positive experience. Yeah. Yes. That's really that's really good. I was watching that um Paris Hilton's um documentary that she did on YouTube and it was so interesting. Like she was doing a set like she DJs and um, she had a guy with her that she was dating and he started a huge argument with her right before she was going on to play. And it's a similar story to yours yeah, because yeah. it was a venue that she had dreamt of being on stage in all of her life. And now she was going to play and this douchebag starts an argument with her because she's doing stuff with press and he felt lone alone. Uh, it was crazy. Yeah, but. She was like almost in tears. She was like begging him, please stop, stop. I'm going on stage. You're going to, you know, I almost started crying watching this documentary because I was just like, I can yeah. only imagine yeah. what someone like, you know, you, her, people who have to perform and be at their best. And before you go on, someone like just messes with that energy, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's why when our band, like we, we kick everybody out of the dressing room like 45 minutes before we go on, which really I don't think is actually enough. Um, you know, but someone always wants to come backstage and say, hey, give you a hug. Yeah. And like, God, I miss those days of hugging people. I, know. I When this turns around, I am going to hug everyone. <laughs> I'm going to hug strangers. I'm going to kiss strangers. People can be like, what's up with this guy? I know. I know. It's crazy. Well, Rich, it was such an amazing time talking to you today, learning about your journey and just sharing this this time with you. I had a great time. Well, I thank love you your so energy. Much. Thank you so much for having me. And I uh, I think you're going to do just fine in this uh, game. You're 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 made for it. Good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so tell everyone where they can keep up with you. I know you've got to be on social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, the uh, the landing place for all things is richredmond.com. It's R E D M O N D. And you can learn about my drumming, speaking, acting, authoring, and my podcast. And uh, oh my God, if we uh, just a shout out from another fellow podcaster, I'd love for you guys to show me some love on the, my podcast, The Rich Redmond Show, on all platforms. Absolutely. I'm going to check it out. I love podcasts. I'm like, I listen to like, a lot of podcasts. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's <laughs> it's good to, you know, compare yourself to I I've been studying Howard Stern for the last couple of years cuz he's such a wonderful interviewer. He really yeah, is good, you he's know. He's good. You take yeah. away the dirty stuff and he can really get in there and no, uncover some the things. dirty stuff. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay. That is really funny. But um, but yeah, and uh, social media, literally across every platform, it's just my name, Rich Redmond. And I'd I'd love for you kids to follow me on Instagram because that's where the kids are. Absolutely. That's where they are. And some old folks too, like us. I know. That's <laughs> for sure. <laughs> All right.